Section sixty three of Wagner the Werewolf by George W. M. Reynolds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter fifty nine. Ferdinand was now at a loss how to act. He felt convinced that it was useless to institute any further inquiries relative to the whereabouts of the secret order of the Rosy Cross, because, had popular rumour ever hinted at any clue in that respect, the garrulous and inquisitive barber would have been sure to hear of it he was not however disheartened no very far from that for he was confident that the same supernatural power that had hitherto directed him and which was rapidly clearing away all obstacles in his path toward perfect emancipation from the influence of the evil one would carry him to a successful and triumphant issue throwing himself therefore entirely on the wisdom and mercy of heaven he roamed about the town of syracuse without any settled object in view until he was more wearied and it was very late he then entered a miserable hostel or inn the best however that he could discover and there having partaken of some refreshment he retired to the chamber allotted to him sleep soon visited his eyes but he had not long enjoyed the sweets of slumber when that balmy repose was interrupted either by a touch or sound he knew not which starting up in his couch he perceived a tall figure muffled in a huge dark mantle and wearing a slouched broad-brimmed hat standing by the side of the bed rise ferdinand wagner said a mild but masculine voice and follow me ye whom thou seekest has sent me to lead thee to him wagner did not hesitate to obey this mandate which he felt certain was connected with the important business that had borne him to syracuse his apparel was speedily assumed and he said i am ready to follow thee stranger whoever thou art and whithersoever thou mayst lead for my faith is in heaven those who have faith shall prosper observed the stranger in a solemn tone he then led the way noiselessly down the deep staircase of the inn and issued forth by the front gate closely followed by wagner in deep silence did they proceed through the dark narrow and tortuous streets leaving at length the town behind them and then entering upon a barren and uneven waste by degrees an object at first dimly seen in the distance and by the uncertain moonlight which was constantly struggling with the dark clouds of a somewhat tempestuous night assumed a more defined appearance until a mass of gigantic ruins at length stood out from the sombre obscurity in a few moments the moon shone forth purely and brightly and its beams falling on decayed buttresses broken gothic arches deep entrance ways remnants of pinnacles and spires massive walls of ruined towers gave a wildly romantic and yet not unpicturesque aspect to the remains of what was evidently once a vast monastic institution the muffled stranger led the way amongst the ruins and at last stopped at a gate opening into a small square enclosure formed by strong iron railings seven feet high and shaped at the points like javelins passing through the gateway the guide conducted wagner into the cemetery which was filled with the marble tombs of the metered abbots who had once held sway over the monastery and the broad lands attached to it you behold around you said the muffled stranger waving his arm toward the ruins all that remains of a sanctuary once the most celebrated in sicily for the piety and wisdom of its inmates but a horrible crime a murder perpetrated under circumstances unusually diabolical the criminal being no less a person than the last lord abbot himself and the victim a beauteous girl whom he had seduced rendered this institution accursed in the eyes of god and man the monks abandoned it and the waste over which you have passed is now the unclaimed but once fertile estate belonging to the abbey the superstition of the sicilians has not failed to invent terrific tales in connection with these ruins and the belief that each night at twelve o'clock the soul of the guilty abbot is driven by the scourge of the demon through the scene alike of his episcopal power and his black turpitude effectually prevents impertinent or inconvenient intrusion the observation with which the muffled stranger concluded his brief narrative convinced wagner that it was amongst those ruins that the brethren of the rosy cross had fixed their secret abode but he had no time for reflection inasmuch as his guide hurried him on amidst the tombs on which the light of the silver moon now streamed with a power and an effect that no dark cloud for the time impaired 
stopping at the base of one of the most splendid monuments in the cemetery the muffled stranger touched some secret spring and a large marble block immediately opened like a door the aperture revealing a narrow flight of stone steps wagner was directed to descend first a command which he obeyed without hesitation his guide closing the marble entrance ere he followed for several minutes the two descended in total darkness at length a faint glimmering light met wagner's view and as he proceeded it grew stronger and stronger until it became of such dazzling brilliancy that his eyes ached with a supernatural splendour that glorious lustre was diffused from a silver lamp hanging to the arched roof of a long passage or corridor of masonry to which the stone steps led fernand wagner said the guide in his mild and somewhat monotonous voice thou now beholdest the eternal lamp of the rosicrucians for a hundred and twenty years has that lamp burnt with as powerful a lustre as that which it now sheds forth and never once no not once during that period has it been replenished no human hand has touched it since the day when it was first suspended there by the great founder of our sect all doubt was now dispelled from the mind of wagner if a doubt he had even for a moment entertained since the muffled stranger had summoned him from the inn he was indeed in the secret abode of the holy sect of the rosy cross his guide too was a member of that brotherhood and there almost too dazzling to gaze upon burnt the eternal lamp which was the symbol of the knowledge cherished by the order wagner turned to gaze in wonder and admiration upon his guide and beneath the broad brim of the slouched hat he beheld a countenance venerable with years imposing with intelligence and benevolent with every human charity wise and philanthropic rosicrucian exclaimed wagner i offer thee my deepest gratitude for having permitted me to enter this sanctuary but how camest thou to learn that i sought admittance hither and unveil to me the great mysteries of this place we are the servants of holy angels who reveal to us in visions the will of the most high answered the rosicrucian and they who commanded me to bring thee hither will induce thine heart to retain our secret inviolable not of the world cried wagner with an enthusiasm which denoted sincerity would i betray ye tis well said the rosicrucian with philosophic calmness as if he put more faith in the protecting influence of heaven than in the promises of man i shall not accompany thee further follow that passage at the extremity there are two corridors branching off in different directions but thou wilt pursue the one leading to the right proceed fearlessly and stop not till thou shalt stand in the presence of the founder of the sect ferdinand hastened to obey these directions and having threaded the two passages he entered a large and rudely hollowed cavern where the feelings of mingled awe and suspense with which he had approached it were immediately changed into deep veneration and wonder as he found himself in the presence of one who by his appearance he knew could be none other than christianus rosencrux never had ferdinand beheld a being of such venerable aspect and though old evidently very old as indeed wagner knew him to be yet the founder of the celebrated rosicrucians manifested every appearance of possessing a vigorous constitution as he was assuredly endowed with a magnificent intellect his beard was long and white as snow a century and three score years had not dimmed the lustre of his eyes and his form though somewhat bent was masculine and well knit he was seated at a table covered with an infinite variety of scientific apparatus and articles of the same nature were strewn upon the ground to the roof hung an iron lamp which indeed burnt faintly after the brilliant lustre of the eternal flame that wagner had seen in the passage but its flickering gleam shone lurid and ominous on a blood-red cross suspended to the wall ferdinand drew near the table and bowed reverentially to the rosicrucian chief who acknowledged his salutation with a benignant smile wagner he said in a firm but mild tone i have been forewarned of thy coming and am prepared to receive thee thy constant and unvarying faith in heaven has opened to thee the gates of salvation and it is mine to direct thee how to act that the dreadful doom which thou hast drawn upon thyself may be annihilated soon and for ever the venerable man paused and ferdinand again bowed lowly and with profound respect so soon as the morning sun shall have revisited this hemisphere continued rosencrux thou must depart for italy 
start not ferdinand but prepare to obey that power which will summon thee on arriving in italy proceed direct to florence and fear not to enter that city even in the broad daylight thou wilt not be harmed there await the current of those circumstances that must lead to the grand event which is ordained to break the spell that has cast upon thee the doom of a werewolf for as thou didst voluntarily unite thyself in the face of heaven with donna nisida riverola so it is decreed for the wisest purposes that a circumstance intimately connected with her destiny must become a charm and a talisman to change thine own on thine arrival in florence therefore seek not to avoid lady nisida but rather hasten at once to her presence and again i say a supernal power will protect thee from any baneful influence which she might still exercise over thee for the spell that the evil one hath cast upon thee ferdinand wagner shall be broken only on that day and in that hour when thine eyes shall behold the skeletons of two innocent victims suspended to the same beam having uttered these words in a louder and hurried but not the less impressive tone than he had first used Christianus Rosencrux motioned impatiently for Wagner to depart, and Ferdinand, amazed and horrified at the dreadful words which had met his ears, retreated from the cavern and sped rapidly back to the spot where he had quitted his guide, whom he found waiting his return beneath the undying lamp. The Rosicrucian conducted Wagner in silence from that deep and subterranean abode beneath the tomb, thence through the cemetery amidst the ruins of the monastery, and across the wild waste, back to Syracuse, nor did the muffled brother of the rosy cross take leave of ferdinand until they had reached the door of the hostel there they parted the rosy crucian invoking a blessing upon the head of wagner who regained his chamber without disturbing the other inmates of the house but with the conflicting emotions of ardent hopes and appalling fears and holy aspirations filling his breast by degrees however as he was enabled to reason to himself with increasing calmness the fears and the doubts became fainter and fainter while the hopes and the aspirations grew stronger and stronger and at length throwing himself upon his knees he exclaimed fervently o lord deal with me as thou wilt thy will be done it was late in the afternoon of a sultry day toward the close of september or to be more particular on the twenty fifth of that month that a numerous and brilliant cavalcade on emerging from a grove that bounded one of the sinuosities of the arno came within sight of the towers and pinnacles of florence on the white felt turbans of a hundred and fifty ottoman soldiers glistened the crescent the symbol of islamism and their steel sheathed scimitars and the trappings of their horses sent forth the martial din as they were agitated by the rapidity of the march forty-eight slaves also mounted on steeds procured at leghorn followed the soldiers with a short interval between the two corps and in the space thus left rode the greek demetrius and lady nisida of riverola the latter wore the garb of her sex and sat upon her horse with the grace of an amazonian queen the moment the cavalcade came in sight of the fair city of flowers a flush of joy and triumph suddenly diffused itself over nisida's countenance and her lips were simultaneously compressed to prevent the utterance of that exclamation of gladness which her heart sent up to her tongue demetrius now commanded a temporary halt addressing himself to a turkish youth who had been attached to his person in the capacity of secretary he said yakub hie thou in advance with an escort of two soldiers and two slaves and push on to florence there seek an immediate interview with the president of the council of state and acquaint that high functionary with the tidings of my approach thou wilt inform him that i am about to enter florence in the peaceful capacity of envoy from the puissant and most glorious ibrahim pasha the vizier of the sultan to treat on divers matters interesting to the honour of the ottoman port and the welfare of all italy in the meantime i shall so check our speed that we may not reach the city until after sunset which arrangement will afford you two full hours to accomplish the mission which i now entrust to thee yakub bowed and hastened to obey the commands which he had received speeding toward florence attended by two soldiers and two slaves demetrius then ordered his party to dismount and rest for a short space upon the banks of the arno some of his slaves immediately pitched a tent into which he conducted nisida and refreshments were served to them 
when the repast was concluded and they were left alone together for a few minutes nisida's manner suddenly changed from calm patrician reserve to a strange agitation her lips quivered her eyes flashed fire and then as if desperately resolved to put into execution the idea which she had formed she seized demetrius by the hand bent her head toward him and murmured in the faintest whisper possible start not to hear the sound of my voice i am neither deaf nor dumb but this is not the place for explanations i have much to tell you you much to hear for i can speak to thee of calanthe and prove that he whom thou servest so zealously is a wretch meriting only thy vengeance my god my god what marvels are now taking place murmured the greek surveying nisida in profound astonishment not unmingled with alarm silence silence i implore you continued she in the rapid low and yet distinctly audible whisper for your sake for mine betray me not deaf and dumb must i appear deaf and dumb must i yet be deemed for a short space but to-night at twelve o'clock you will meet me demetrius in the garden of the riverola mansion and then i will conduct you to an apartment where we may confer without fear of being overheard without danger of interruption i will not fail thee lady said the greek scarcely able to recover from the amazement into which nisida's sudden revelation of her power of speech and hearing had thrown him then as an oppressing feeling seized upon his soul he demanded but calanthe lady in the name of heaven one word more and let that word give me hope that i may see my sister again demetrius answered nisida her countenance becoming ominous and sombre you will never behold her more the lust of ibrahim pasha nay start not so violently brought destruction and death upon calanthe the features of the young greek were at first distorted with anguish and tears started from his eyes but in the next moment their expression changed to one denoting the fiercest rage nisida understood all that was passing in his soul and she bent upon him a significant glance which said more eloquently than language could have done yes vengeance thou shalt have she then rose from the velvet cushions which had been spread upon the ground within the tent and waving her hand in token of temporary farewell to demetrius hastened forth mounted her horse and departed alone and unattended toward florence great was the surprise that evening of the numerous servants and dependents at the riverola mansion when donna nisida suddenly reappeared after an absence of very nearly seven months and that absence so unaccountable to them although her haughty and imperious manner had never been particularly calculated to render her beloved to the menials of the household yet her supposed affliction of deafness and dumbness had naturally made her an object of interest and moreover as close upon three months had elapsed since count francisco himself had disappeared in a strange and alarming way two days only after his return from the wars the domestics were pleased to behold at least one member of the lost family come back amongst them as it was with sincere demonstrations of delight that the dependents and menials welcomed donna nisida at riverola and she was not ungracious enough to receive their civilities with coldness but she speedily escaped from the ceremonies of this reception and intimating by signs to the female minions who were about to escort her to her apartments that she was anxious to be alone she hurried thither her heart leaping with joy at the thought of being once more beneath the roof of the palace of her forefathers and ferdinand wast thou forgotten oh no no in spite of all her revived schemings and new plots nisida thy will beloved nisida had room in her heart for thine image on reaching her own suite of apartments the key of which had been handed to her by one of the female dependents nisida found herself in the very same state as when she last was there and it appeared to her a dream yes a very wondrous dream that she had been absent for nearly seven months and during that period had seen and experienced such strange vicissitudes the reader need scarcely be informed that nisida's first impulse on entering her own suite of apartments in the riverola mansion was to hasten and gaze once more upon the portrait of her mother and intent earnest enthusiastic was the unpraised look now fixed upon that portrait even as when we first saw nisida contemplating the sweet and benignant countenance in the second chapter of our narrative yes and again was her gaze indicative of a devotion an adoration a worship oh my sainted mother thought nisida within her breast 
i have not proved ultimately faithless to the solemn vows i pledged to thee upon thy death-bed no if for a time i yielded to the voluptuous idleness of love and passion in that now far-off mediterranean isle yet at last did i arouse myself to energy for young francisco's sake and i came back as soon as heaven sent me the means of return to the place where my presence may best serve his interests and carry out thy wishes for oh when thou wast alive my worshipped my adored mother how good how kind how affectionate wast thou toward me and that tenderness of a mother for her offspring ah how well can i comprehend it now for i also shall soon become a mother yes ferdinand within the last week i have received the conviction that a being bearing thine image will see the light in due time and the honour of the proud name of riverola requires that our child must not be born of an unwedded mother but wilt thou seek me out ferdinand oh where art thou now whither was the bark in which i beheld thee last wafting thee away and all the while that these thoughts were agitating within her mind donna nisida kept her eyes intently fixed on the portrait but on reflecting a second time that she should fail to meet with wagner soon again or should he prove faithless to her or if indeed he should nurse resentment and loathing for her on account of her unworthy conduct toward him on the island and that her child should be born of an unwedded mother when we say she thought of this dread probability a second time she burst into tears and turned away from the contemplation of her mother's countenance and nisida so seldom wept that when her tears did escape the usually sealed up springs of her emotions they came in torrents and were most bitter and painful to shed but she at length triumphed over her feelings or rather their outpourings relieved her and now the remembrance of another duty which she had resolved upon performing the moment she should reach home again was uppermost in her mind she contemplated a visit to the mysterious closet the dark cabinet of horrible secrets in order to ascertain whether curiosity had triumphed over francisco's prudence or if any one indeed had violated the loneliness of that chamber in which the late count of riverola had breathed his last she accordingly took a lamp in her hand for it was now far advanced in the evening and proceeded to the apartment where her father's dying injunctions had been given to her brother and which that father and that brother had so little suspected to have been heard and greedily drunk in by her ears the door of the room was locked nisida accordingly proceeded forthwith to her brother's chamber and there in a secret place where she knew he had been accustomed to keep papers or valuables she found the key of the chamber containing the mysterious closet but not the key of the closet itself of this latter circumstance she was glad inasmuch as she conceived that he had adopted her counsel to carry it invariably secured about his person so that no prying domestics might use it in his absence returning therefore with the one key which she had found she entered the apartment where her father had breathed his last unchanged was its appearance in mournfulness and gloom unchanged in arrangements and features precisely the same as when she last was there on the night when she had intercepted the banditti in their predatory visit she drew aside the hangings of the bed a cloud of dust flew out and for a few moments she stood gazing on the couch where the dark spirit of her sire had fled from its mortal tenement and as she still lingered near the bed the remembrance of the death scene came so vividly back to her mind that for an instant she fancied she beheld the cold stern relentless countenance of the late count of riverola upon the pillow and she turned away more in loathing and abhorrence than alarm for through her brain flashed in dread association with his memory the awful words and as the merciless scalpel hacked and hewed away at the still almost palpitating flesh of the murdered man in whose breast the dagger remained deeply buried a ferocious joy a savage hyena-like triumph filled my soul and i experienced no remorse for the deed i had done yes she turned aside and was advancing rapidly toward the mysterious closet when holy god was it reality or imagination was it a human being or a spectre from another world for a tall dark form muffled apparently in a long cowl or it might be a cloak but nisida was too bewildered to discriminate aright glided from the middle of the room where her eyes first beheld it and was lost to view almost as soon as seen strong-minded as nisida was indomitable as was her courage and far away as she was from being superstitious yet now she staggered reeled and would have fallen had she not come in contact with the mysterious closet 
against which she leaned for support she gasped for breath and her eyes were fixed wildly upon the door by which the figures had disappeared nevertheless she had so far retained her presence of mind as to grasp the lamp firmly in her hand and at that moment after such a fright in the room where her father had died and in the close vicinity of the fearful cabinet even nisida would have fainted with terror to be left in darkness twas imagination naught save imagination she thought within herself as she exerted all her power to surmount the alarms that had seized upon her but no i remember to have closed the door carefully behind me and now it is open as that reminiscence and conviction flashed to her mind she nerved herself to advance into the passage but all was silent and not a soul was there save herself scarcely knowing what to think yet ashamed to give way to superstitious fears nisida retraced her steps and proceeded to examine the door of the closet she was satisfied that it had never been opened since the night of her father's death for the seals which she had induced francisco to place upon the lock next day were still there but all the while she was thus scrutinizing the door the lock and the seals she could not help occasionally casting a furtive glance around to convince herself that the tall dark muffled form was not standing behind her and as she retraced her way to her own apartments she stopped now and then through dread that other footsteps beside her own echoed in the long and lonely corridors of the old mansion she however regained her chamber in safety and fell into a deep reverie respecting the tall figure she had seen were it not for the fact of which she was confident of her having closed the door on entering the room where her father had died she would have concluded that her imagination had deluded her but she now feared lest she might be watched by spies for some unknown and hostile purpose it was perplexing to say the least of it and nisida determined to adopt all possible precautions against her secret enemies whoever they might be she accordingly arose from her seat and put off her upper garment donned her thin but strong corslet and then assumed the black velvet robe which reached up to her throat concealing the armour beneath a flexible dagger that fatal weapon which had dealt death to the unfortunate agnes was next thrust into the sheath formed by the wide border of her stomacher and nisida smiled with haughty triumph as if in defiance to her foes she then repaired to one of the splendid saloons of the mansion and ere she sat down to the repast that was served up she dispatched a note acquainting dr Giraffe with her return and requesting his immediate presence in about half an hour the physician arrived and the joy at beholding nisida again was only equalled by his impatience to learn the cause of her long absence and all that had befallen her during the interval she made a sign for the old man to follow her to the retirement of her own apartments and then having closed the door she said to him in a low tone doctor we will converse by means of signs no more for though still being forced to simulate the deaf and dumb in the presence of the world yet now with you who have all along known my terrible secret our discourse must be too important to be carried on by mere signs nisida returned Giras, also in a low and cautious tone thou knowest that i love thee as if thou wast my own daughter and thy voice sounds like music upon my ears but when will the dreadful necessity which renders thee dumb before the world when will it cease nisida soon soon doctor if thou wilt aid me answered the lady a long and earnest conversation then ensued but it is not necessary to give the details to the reader inasmuch as their nature will soon transpire suffice it to say that nisida urged a particular request which she backed by such explanation and we must also say misrepresentations as she thought suitable to her purpose and that dr duras eventually though not without compunction and hesitation at length acceded to her prayer she then gave him a brief account of her abduction from florence by the villain stefano her long residence on the island of snakes and her deliverance from thence by the ottoman fleet which was now off the port of leghorn but she said nothing of ferdinand wagner nor did she inform the physician that she was acquainted with the cause of francisco's disappearance and the place where he was detained at length dr duras took his leave but ere he left the room nisida caught him by the hand saying in a low yet impressive tone remember your solemn promise my dear friend and induce your brother to leave flora francatelli to her fate i will i will answered the physician and after all you have told me and if she be really the bad profligate and evil disposed girl you represent her it will be well that the inquisition should hold her tight in its grasp with these words dr duras departed 
leaving nisida to gloat over the success which her plans had thus far experienced End of section sixty three Section sixty four of Wagner the Werewolf by George W. M. Reynolds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter sixty, part one. It was verging toward midnight, and the moon was concealed behind dark clouds when a tall figure, muffled in a cloak, climbed over the railing which enclosed one portion of the spacious garden attached to the Riverola Palace. That person was Ferdinand Wagner. He had arrived in Florence two days before that on which Nisida returned to the ancestral dwelling. He had entered the city boldly and openly in the joyous sunlight, and yet no one molested him. He even encountered some of the very sbirri who had arrested him in the preceding month of February. They saluted him respectfully, thus showed that they recognized him, but offered not to harm him. His trial, his condemnation, and his escape appeared all to have been forgotten. He repaired to his mansion. His servants, who had remained in possession of the dwelling, received him with demonstrations of joy and welcome as if he had just returned under ordinary circumstances from a long journey. Truly, then, he was blessed by the protection of heaven, and, more wondrous still, on entering his favourite room he beheld all his pictures in their proper places, as if none of them had ever been removed, as if the confiscation of several by the criminal tribunal had never taken place over the one which had proclaimed the secret of his doom to the judges and the audience on the occasion of his trial still hung the black cloth and an indefinable curiosity no not a sentiment of curiosity but one of hope impelled him to remove the covering and how exquisite was his joy how great his amazement how sincere his thanksgivings when he beheld but a blank piece of canvas the horrible picture of the werewolf a picture which he had painted when in a strangely morbid state of mind had disappeared here was another sign of heaven's goodness a further proof of celestial mercy on instituting inquiries ferdinand had learnt that donna nisida had not yet come back to florence but he employed trusty persons to watch and give him notice of her arrival the instant it should occur thus nisida had not been half an hour at the riverola mansion when ferdinand was made acquainted with her return from the conversation which had taken place between them at various times on the island and as the reader is well aware wagner felt convinced that nisida would again simulate deafness and dumbness and he was therefore desirous to avoid giving her any surprise by appearing abruptly before her a proceeding which might evoke a sudden ejaculation and thus betray her secret moreover he knew not whether circumstances would render his visits made in a public manner agreeable to her and perhaps pardon him gentle reader perhaps he was also curious to learn whether she still thought of him or whether the excitement of her return had absorbed all tender feelings of that nature influenced by these various motives wagner muffled himself in a long tuscan cloak and repaired to the vicinity of the riverola mansion he passed through the gardens without encountering any one and perceiving a side door open he entered the building ascending the stairs he thought that he should be acting in accordance with the advice given him by rosencrux and also consistent with prudence were it once to seek an interview with nisida privately he therefore repaired in the direction of the principal saloons of the palace but losing his way amidst the maze of corridors he was about to retire when he beheld the object of his search the beautiful nisida enter a room with a lamp in hand he now felt convinced that he should meet her alone and he hurried after her in pursuance of his cautious plan he opened the door gently and was already in the middle of the apartment when he perceived nisida standing by the side of a bed and with her head fixed in that immovable manner which indicates intent gazing upon some object instantly supposing that some invalid reposed in that couch and now seized with a dreadful alarm lest nisida on beholding him should utter a sudden ejaculation which would betray the secret of her feigned dumbness ferdinand considerately retreated with all possible speed nor was he aware that nisida had observed him much less that his appearance there had excited such fears in her breast those fears being greatly enhanced by his negligence in leaving the door open behind him oh had nisida known it was thou ferdinand wagner how joyous how happy she would have been for the conviction that she bore the pledge of your mutual passion made her heart yearn that eve to meet with thee again and was it a like attraction on thy part 
or the mysterious influence that now guided all thy movements which induced thee at midnight to enter the riverola gardens again that thou mightest be as it were upon the same spot where she dwelt and scent the fragrance of the same flowers that perfumed the atmosphere which she breathed oh doubtless it was that mysterious influence for thou hast now that power within thee may which made thee strong to resist all the blandishments of the siren and to prefer the welfare of thine own soul to wart in this world beside we said then at the commencement of this chapter that ferdinand entered the riverola gardens shortly after midnight but scarcely had he crossed the iron railings turned into the nearest path formed by shrubs and evergreens when he was startled by hearing another person enter the grounds in the same unceremonious manner ferdinand accordingly stood aside in the deep shade of the trees and in a few moments a figure muffled like himself in a cloak passed him rapidly by wagner was debating in himself what course he should pursue for he feared that some treachery was intended toward nisida when to his boundless surprise he heard the mysterious visitant say in a low tone is it you lady to which his question the unmistakable and never to be forgotten voice of his nisida answered tis i demetrius follow me noiselessly and breathe not another word for the present ferdinand was shocked and grieved at what he had just heard and which savoured so strongly of an intrigue had not his ears deceived him was this the nisida from whom he had parted but little more than three weeks back and who had left him that tender note which he had found in the hut on the island but he had no time for reflection the pair were moving rapidly towards the mansion and wagner unhesitatingly followed his footsteps being soundless on the damp soil of the borders of flowers and his form being concealed by the shade of the tall evergreens which he skirted he watched nisida and her companion until they disappeared by a small private door at the back of the mansion and this door was by them incautiously left unlocked though shut close it opened rapidly to wagner's hand and he found himself at the foot of a dark staircase the sound of ascending steps on which he met his ears up that narrow flight he sped noiselessly but hastily and in a few moments he was stopped by another door which had just closed behind those whom he was following here he was compelled to pause in the hope that the partition might not be so thick as completely to intercept the sounds of the voices in the chamber but after listening with breathless attention for a few minutes he could not catch even the murmuring of a whisper it now struck him that nisida and her companion might have passed on into a room more remote than the one to which that door had admitted them and he resolved to follow on accordingly he opened the door with such successful precaution that not a sound not even the creaking of the hinge was the result and he immediately perceived that there was a thick curtain within for it will be recollected that this door was behind the drapery of nisida's bed at the same time a light somewhat subdued by the thick curtain appeared and the sound of voices met ferdinand's ears signor said the melodious voice of nisida in its sweetest softest tones it is due to myself to tender fitting excuse for introducing you thus into my private chamber but the necessity of discoursing together without fear of interruption and in some place that is secure from the impertinence of eavesdroppers must serve as an apology lady replied demetrius it needed no explanation of your motive in bringing me hither to command on my part that respect which is due to you a weight was removed from wagner's mind it was assuredly no tender sentiment that had brought nisida and the greek together this night and the curiosity of ferdinand was therefore excited all the more strongly we will not waste time in unnecessary parlance resumed nisida after a short pause nor must you seek to learn the causes the powerful causes which have urged me to impose upon myself the awful sacrifice involved in the simulation of the loss of speech and hearing suffice it for you to know that when on board the capitan pasha ship i overheard every syllable of the conversation which one day took place between the apostate ibrahim and yourself a conversation wherein you gave a detailed account of all your proceedings at florence and in the course of which you spoke feelingly of your sister calanthe alas poor calanthe exclaimed demetrius in a mournful tone and is she really no more listen to me while i relate the manner in which i became aware of her fate said nisida she then explained the treacherous visit of the grand vizier to the chamber wherein she had slept on board the ottoman admiral's ship the way in which the ethiopian slave had interrupted to save her 
and the conversation that had taken place between ibrahim and the negro revealing the dread fate of calanthe is it possible that i have served so faithfully a man possessed of such a demon heart cried demetrius but i will have vengeance lady yes the murdered calanthe shall be avenged and i too must have vengeance upon the proud and insolent vizier who sought to violate all the laws of hospitality in respect to me observed nisida and who seeks to marry his sister the low-born flora the sister of the base renegade to the illustrious scion of the noble house of riverola vengeance too must i have upon the wretch antonio the panderer to my father's illicit and degrading amours the miscreant who sought to plunder this mansion and who even dared to utter threats against me in that conversation with his accomplice venturo which you signor overheard in the streets of florence this game wretch it is too who consigned my brother to the custody of the banditti and though for certain reasons i deplore not that captivity which francisco has endured inasmuch as it has effectually prevented him from interesting himself on behalf of flora francatelli yet as antonio was animated by vengeance only in so using my brother he shall pay the penalty due on account of all his crimes and in the task of punishing antonio lady said demetrius shall i be right glad to aid or did not the villain deceive me infamously in respect to the dispatches which i sought to forward to constantinople when last i was at florence and not contented with that vile treachery even plotted with his accomplice venturo against my life vengeance then upon our enemies demetrius exclaimed nisida and this is how our aim shall be accomplished she continued in a lower and less excited tone the ambitious views of ibrahim pasha must experience a signal defeat and as he is too powerful to be personally injured by us we must torture his soul by crushing his relations we must punish him through the medium of his sister and his aunt this evening i had a long discourse with dr duras who is devoted to my interests and over whom i wield a wondrous power of persuasion he has undertaken to induce his brother angelo duras to abandon the cause of the francatellis and the inquisition will therefore deal with them as it lists father marco i can also manage as i will he understands the language in which the deaf and dumb converse for he has so long been confessor to our family to-morrow i'll undertake to send him to rome on some charitable mission connected with the church thus the only persons whom you secured when you last were in florence in the interests of the francatellis will cease to watch over them and as they are accused of being accomplices in the sacrilege perpetrated in the carmelite convent naught will save them from the flames of the auto da fe oh the spirit of the murdered calanthe exclaimed demetrius with savage joy thou wilt be avenged yet and thou false vizier shall writhe in the flames at the stake now as for antonio and the rest of the banditti who stormed the convent and gave freedom to the hated flora who have likewise captured my brother and who have so long been a terror to florence continued nisida we must annihilate them all at one blow not a soul of the gang must be spared nisida knew full well that at least some of the banditti were acquainted with the fact that she was the murderess of agnes and that they could also tell an awkward tale of how she sought to bribe them to rescue ferdinand wagner in case of an adverse judgment on the part of the criminal tribunal the total annihilation of the horde was consequently the large aim at which she aspired and her energetic mind shrunk not from any difficulty that might appear in the way toward the execution of that object the design is grand but not without its obstacles observed demetrius your ladyship shall moreover adopt measures to rescue the lord count of riverola first by means of gold everything can be accomplished amongst villains returned nisida and the necessary preliminaries to carrying out our object rest with you signor to-morrow morning you must seek antonio he knows not that you suspect his villainy and as you will say nothing relative to the failure in the arrival of your dispatches at constantinople he will rest secure in the belief that you have not yet discovered that deed of treachery you must represent yourself as the mortal enemy of the count of riverola and so speak as to lead antonio to confess to you where he is and offer to become the instrument of your vengeance then bribe antonio heavily to deliver up francisco into your power to-morrow night at a particular hour 
and at a place not far from the spot where you know the secret entrance of the banditti's stronghold to be all this lady said demetrius can be easily arranged antonio would barter his soul for gold much more readily then will he sell the count of riverola to one who bids high for the possession of the noble prisoner but this is not all resumed nisida tis merely the preface to my plan so soon as the shades of to-morrow's evening shall have involved the earth in obscurity a strong part of your soldiers properly disguised but well armed must repair in small sections or even singly to that grove where you have already obtained a clue to the entrance of the robbers stronghold let them conceal themselves amongst the trees in the immediate vicinity of the enormous chestnut that overhangs the precipice when the robbers emerge from their lurking place with francisco your soldiers will immediately seize upon them should you then discover the secret of the entrance to the stronghold the object will be gained your men will penetrate into the subterranean den and the massacre of the horde will prove an easy matter but should it occur that those banditti who may be employed in leading forth my brother do shut up the entrance of their den so speedily that your dependents discover not its secrets then must we trust to bribery or threats to wrest that secret from the miscreants at all events antonio will be present to accompany francisco to the place which you will appoint to meet them and as the villain will fall into your power it will perhaps prove less difficult to induce him to betray his comrades than it might be to persuade any of the manditti himself lady your plan has every element of success observed demetrius and all shall be done as you suggest indeed i will myself conduct the expedition but should you thus at once effect the release of don francisco will he not oppose your designs relative to the condemnation of flora francatelli by the inquisition dr duras is well acquainted with the precise process answered nisida and from him i learnt that the third examination of the prisoners will take place to-morrow when judgment will be produced should no advocate appear to urge a feasible cause of delay the arrests took place on the third of july said demetrius and angelo duras undertook to obtain a postponement for three months to-morrow lady is but the twenty sixth of september true responded nisida but were a delay granted it would be for eight days and thus you perceive how nicely angelo duras has weighed all the intricacies of the case and how accurately he has calculated the length of the term to be gained by the exercise of the subtleties of the inquisitorial law therefore as no advocate will appear to demand delay flora is certain to be condemned to-morrow night and the release of francisco may take place simultaneously for when once the grand inquisitor shall have pronounced the extreme sentence no human power can reverse it and now added nisida but one word more the grand vizier commanded you to dispatch a courier daily to leghorn with full particulars of all your proceedings see that those accounts be of a nature to lull the treacherous ibrahim into security for were he to learn that his aunt and sister are in dread peril he would be capable of marching at the head of all his troops to sack the city of florence fear not on that subject lady answered demetrius i will so amuse the demon-hearted grand vizier by my dispatches that he shall become excited with joyous hopes and that the blow the dread blow which we are preparing for him may be the more terribly severe the greek then rose to take his leave of donna nisida and wagner having closed the secret door as noiselessly as he had opened it hurried away from the riverola mansion bewildered and grieved at all he had heard for he could no longer conceal from himself that a very fiend was incarnate in the shape of her whom he had loved so madly having tossed on a feverish couch for upward of an hour unable to banish from his mind the cold-blooded plot which nisida and demetrius had resolved upon in order to consign flora francatelli and her equally innocent aunt to the stake wagner at last slept through sheer exhaustion then christianus rosencrux appeared to him in a dream and said heaven hath chosen thee as the instrument to defeat the iniquitous purposes of riverola in respect of two guiltless and deserving women angelo duras is an upright man but he is deluded and misled by the representations made to him by nisida through his brother the physician relative to the true character of flora in the evening at nine o'clock hie to angelo duras command him in the name of justice and humanity to do his duty toward his clients and he will obey thee then having performed this much 
speed thou without delay to leghorn and seek the grand vizier ibrahim pasha to him shalt thou merely state that demetrius is a traitor and that tremendous perils hang over the heads of the vizier's much-loved relatives manifest no hatred to the vizier on account of his late treacherous intention with regard to the honour of nisida for vengeance belongeth not to mortals and in these measures only of all the deeply ramified plots and designs which thou didst here discuss between nisida and demetrius shall thou interfere leave the rest to heaven the founder of the rosicrucians disappeared and when fernand awoke late in the day for his slumber had been long and deep he remembered the vision which he had seen and resolved to obey the order he had received beneath the massive and heavy tower of the palazzo del podesta or ducal palace of florence was the tribunal of the holy inquisition small low and terribly sombre in appearance was this court with walls of the most solid masonry an arched roof and a pavement formed of vast blocks of dark veined marble thither the light of heaven never penetrated for it was a situate far below the level of the earth and at the very foundation of that tower which rose frowning and sullen high above iron lamps diffused a lurid lustre around rendering ghastly the countenance alike of the oppressors and the oppressed and when it was deemed necessary to invest the proceedings with a more awe-inspiring solemnity than usual torches borne by the familiars or officers of the inquisition were substituted for these iron lamps over the judgment seat was suspended a large crucifix on one side of the court were three doors one communicating with the corridor and flight of stone steps leading to and from the tribunal the second affording admission into the torture chamber and the third opening to the prisons of the inquisition end of section sixty four Section sixty five of Mark and the Werewolf by George W. M. Reynolds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter sixty, part two. It was about seven o'clock in the evening, on the twenty sixth of September, that Flora Francatelli and her aunt were placed before the Grand Inquisitor to be examined for the second time. When the familiars, habited in their long black ecclesiastical dresses with the strange cowls or hoods shading their stern and remorseless countenances, led in the two females from the separate cells in which they had been confined, the first and natural impulse of the unhappy creatures was to rush into each other's arms, but they were immediately torn rudely asunder, and so stationed in the presence of the Grand Inquisitor as to have a considerable interval between them but the glances which the aunt and niece exchanged gave encouragement and hope to each other and the sentiments which prompted those glances were really cherished by the persecuted females inasmuch as father marco who had been permitted to visit them occasionally dropped sundry hints of coming aid and powerful though invisible protection thereby cheering their hearts to some little extent and mitigating the intensity of their apprehensions flora was very pale but never perhaps had she appeared more beautiful for her large blue eyes expressed the most melting softness and her dark brown hair hung dishevelled over her shoulders while her bosom heaved with the agitation of suspense woman said the grand inquisitor glancing first to the aunt and then to the niece his eyes however lingering upon the latter know ye of what ye are accused let the younger speak first my lord answered flora in a firmer tone than might have been expected from the feelings indicated by her outward appearance when on a former occasion i stood in the presence of your eminence i expressed my belief that secret enemies were conspiring for their own bad purposes to ruin my beloved relative and myself and yet i call heaven to witness my solemn declaration that knowingly and wilfully we have wronged no one by word or deed young woman exclaimed the grand inquisitor thou hast answered my questions evasively wast thou not an inmate of that most holy sanctuary the convent of carmelite nuns wast thou not there the companion of guilia of aristino did not a sacrilegious horde of miscreants break into the convent headed or at least accompanied by a certain manuel d'orsini who was the lover of the countess was not this invasion of the sacred place undertaken to rescue that guilty woman and did she not find an aslam at the abode of your aunt doubtless with your connivance until the day of her arrest none of those circumstances my lord replied flora do i attempt to deny 
but it is so easy to give them a variety of colourings some of which alas may seem most unfavourable to my venerable relative and to myself o oh, my lord do with me what thou wilt exclaimed flora clasping her hands together in a single paroxysm of anguish but release that aged woman suffer not my beloved aunt my more than mother to be thus persecuted have mercy my lord upon her oh have mercy great judge upon her flora dearest flora cried dame francatelli the tears trickling fast down her countenance i do not wish to leave you i do not seek to be set free i will stay in this dreadful place so long as you remain a prisoner also for though we are separated woman exclaimed the grand inquisitor not altogether unmoved by this touching scene the tribunal cannot take heed of supplications and prayers of an impassioned nature it has to do with facts not feelings at this moment there was a slight sensation amongst the familiars stationed near the door of the judgment hall and an individual who had just entered the court and who wore the black robe and the cap or talk of a counsellor advanced toward the grand inquisitor by lord said the advocate with a reverential bow the day after the arrest of these females i submitted to the council of state a memorial setting forth certain facts which induced the president of the council to issue his warrant to order the postponement of the second examination of the two prisoners now before your eminence until this day and the case has been postponed accordingly answered the grand inquisitor it will now proceed unless reasonable cause can be shown for further delay the prisoners are obstinate instead of confessing their heinous crimes and throwing themselves on the mercy of heaven for past the hope of human mercy they are they assuredly break forth into impassioned language savouring of complaint indeed the younger attributes to the machinations of unknown enemies the position in which she is placed yet have we positive proof that she was leagued with those who perpetrated the sacrilege which ended in the destruction of the carmelite convent and the elder prisoner gave refuge not only to the younger girl her niece but also to a woman more guilty still thus rendering herself infamous as one who encouraged and concealed the enemies of the church instead of giving them up to the most holy inquisition wherefore continues the grand inquisitor it remaineth only for me to order the prisoners to be put to the torture that they may confess their crimes and receive the condemnation which they merit had the terrible word torture dame francatelli uttered a cry of agony but it was even more on account of her beloved niece than herself while flora endowed with greater firmness than her aunt would have flown to console and embrace her had not the familiars cruelly compelled the young maiden to retain her place my lord said angelo duras for he was the advocate who appeared on behalf of the prisoners i formally and earnestly demand a delay of eight days ere this final examination be proceeded with it is impossible returned the grand inquisitor while his words went like ice shafts to the hearts of the unhappy women in addition to the charges against them which i have already glanced at it appeareth that one alessandro francatelli who was nearly related to them both hath abjured the christian faith and become a mussulman this fact was reported many months ago to the council of state and in the cottage lately habited by the prisoners was found a costly set of jewels ornamented with sundry moslem devices and symbols all of which are hateful to the true catholic it is therefore natural to suppose that they themselves have secretly abjured their country's religion and have already received the reward of their apostasy no never never exclaimed the aunt clasping her hands together and showing more anguish by this cruel suspicion than by any other portion of the treatment which she had received at the hands of the inquisition on her side flora appeared to be astounded at the accusation made against her aunt and herself by the grand inquisitor my lord said angelo duras the very statement which has just been put forth by your eminence furnishes a new ground whereon i base my requisition for a delay of eight days in order to prepare a fitting defence on behalf of the prisoners the council of state is now sitting in deliberation on certain demands made by the newly arrived ottoman envoy and should your eminence refuse my requisition for a delay it will be my duty forthwith to apply to that august body the grand inquisitor endeavoured to reason with the advocate on the inconvenience of obstructing the business of the tribunal but angelo duras knowing that he had the law on his side was firm and the judge was finally compelled to accord the delay flora and her aunt were accordingly conveyed back each to a separate cell while angelo duras retired murmuring to himself i shall doubtless offend my brother by my conduct in this respect 
after my solemn promise to him to abandon the cause of the francatellis but i prefer having obeyed that young man of godlike aspect and persuasive manner who visited me ere now to abjure me not to neglect my duty the next case that occupied the attention of the grand inquisitor on the present occasion was that of the jew isaacar ben solomon the old man was indeed a miserable spectacle his garments hung loosely about his wasted and attenuated form his countenance was wan and ghastly but the fire of his eyes was not altogether quenched he was heavily chained and as he walked between the two familiars who led him into the tribunal he could scarcely drag himself along for the persecuted old man had been confined for nearly seven months in the prison of the inquisition and during that period he had suffered acutely with the damps of his dungeon the wretched food doled out to him and the anguish occasioned by conscious innocence unjustly accused of the dreadful crime jew said the grand inquisitor when last thou wast examined by me thou didst obstinately refuse to confess thy grievous sins this is the day for the final investigation of thy case and thou mayest produce witnesses in thy favour if thou canst my lord replied isaacar ben solomon in a weak and tremulous voice unless heaven should work a miracle in my favour i have no hope in this life i do not fear death my lord for persecuted reviled despised accused as i am i can yet lay my hand on my heart and say i have never injured a fellow-creature but my lord he continued his voice growing stronger with excitement it is sufficient that i am a jew to ensure my condemnation and yet strange indeed is that christian faith or rather should i say most inconsistent is the conduct of those who profess it in so far as this ruthless persecution of my race is concerned for where my lord is your charity where is your tolerance where is your mercy if i be indeed involved in mental darkness tis for you to enlighten me with argument not coerce me with chains never have i insulted a christian on account of his creed wherefore should i be insulted in mine granting that the jew is in error he surely deserves pity not persecution for how came i by the creed which i profess even as your lordship obtained yours which is that of christian our parents reared us each in the belief which they respectively professed and there is no more merit due to your eminence for being a christian and there is blame to be attached to me for being a jew had all the religions of the earth been submitted to our consideration when we were children and had it been said to each of us select a faith for yourself then there might be some merit in choosing the one most popular and the most assuredly conductive to personal safety but such was not the case my lord and i am a jew for the same reason that you are a christian and i cling to the creed of my forefathers even as you adhere tenaciously to that faith which your ancestors have handed down to you reproach me not then because i am a jew and now i will pass to another subject my lord continued isaachar becoming more and more animated as he proceeded i am accused of a fearful crime of murder the evidence rests upon the fact that the stains of blood were observed upon the floor of a room in my house the answer is simple two men one of noble birth the other a robber fought in the room and the blood of one of them flowed from a slight wound this is the truth and yet i know that i am not believed merciful heavens of what would you accuse me of murder and it was hinted when last i stood before your eminence that the jews had been known to slay christian children as an offering to heaven my lord the jews worshipped the same god as the christians for well, the christians adopt that book in which the jews put faith then i appeal to your eminence whether the god whom the christians worship would delight in such sacrifices and as you must answer nay the reply acquits the jews also of the hideous calumny sought to be a fix upon us the jews my lord are a merciful and humane race the records of your tribunals will prove that the jews are not addicted to the shedding of blood they are too patient enduring and resigned to be given to vengeance behold how they cling to each other how they assist each other in distress and charity is not narrowed to small circles my lord it is a sentiment which must be expansive because it nourisheth itself and is cherished by those good feelings which are its only reward 
think you my lord that if i saw a fellow-creature starving in the street i should wait to ask him whether he were a christian a jew or a mussulman oh no no the world's bread was given for men of all nations and all creeds isaacar would have continued his address to the grand inquisitor but sheer exhaustion compelled him to desist and he would have sunk upon the cold marble had not the familiar supported him by his own words is he convicted of disbelief in the most holy catholic faith said the grand inquisitor that i find by a memorial which was addressed to me many months ago indeed very shortly after the arrest of this miserable unbeliever and signed by manuel marquis of orsini that the said marquis hath important evidence to give on behalf of the jew now though manuel d'orsini be himself a prisoner of the holy office yet as he hath not yet been judged he is a competent witness orders were then given to introduce the marquis and isaacar ben Sullivan murmured to himself is it possible that the young man can have felt sympathy for me ah then i was not mistaken in him in spite of his dissipation and his wildness he possesses a generous heart in a few minutes the marquis of orsini was led into the judgment hall he was chained but he carried his head erect and though his countenance was pale and careworn his spirit was not crushed he bowed respectfully but not cringingly to the grand inquisitor and bestowed a friendly nod of recognition upon the jew this memorial dated in the month of march last was signed by you said the grand inquisitor interrogatively as he displayed a paper to the marquis that memorial was signed by me answered orsini in a firm tone and i rejoice that your eminence has at length granted me an opportunity of explaining the matter hinted at therein your eminence sits there it is presumed to administer justice then let justice be done toward this innocent man alibi that he is a jew for solemnly do i declare that the blood which stained the floor in isaacar's house flowed from my right arm and it may not be amiss to observe continued the marquis that the worthy jew there did not only bind the wound for me with as much care as if i myself had been an idrislite or he a christian but he moreover offered me the aid of his purse and therefore am i under obligations to him which i could never wholly discharge in good sooth my lord added manuel in whom neither a lengthened imprisonment nor the awful solemnity of the present scene could entirely subdue the flippancy which was habitual in his speech he is a splendid specimen of a jew and i pray your eminence to discharge him forthwith this levity ill becometh you manuel d'orsini said the grand inquisitor for you yourself are in terrible danger then upon a signal given the familiars conveyed the marquis back to his dungeon but ere he left the judgment hall he had the satisfaction of beholding the jew's eyes fixed upon him with an expression of boundless gratitude and deep sympathy tears too were trickling down the cheeks of the israelite for the old man thought within himself what matters if the rack dislocate my limbs but it is shocking oh it is shocking to reflect that thy fellow-creatures noble youth shall dare to deface and injure that godlike form of thine jew suddenly exclaimed the grand inquisitor i put no faith in the testimony of the witness who has just appeared in thy favour confess thy sins avow openly that thou hast murdered christian children to obtain their blood for use in thy sacrifices and seek forgiveness from heaven by embracing the faith of jesus the unhappy israelite was so appalled by the open positive and undisguised manner in which an atrocious charge was revived against him that he lost all power of utterance and stood stupefied and aghast away with him to the torture chamber cried the grand inquisitor in a stern remorseless tone monster exclaimed the jew suddenly recovering his speech as that dreadful mandate warned him that he would now require all his energy all his presence of mind monster he repeated in a voice indicative of loathing and contempt and thou art a christian the familiars hurried isaacar away to the torture chamber which as before stated opened upon the tribunal and terrible indeed was the appearance of that earthly hell that terrestrial hades invented by fiends in human shape that den of horrors constituting indeed a fitting foretaste of transtegian torment the grand inquisitor followed the victim and the familiars into this awful place and on a signal given by that high functionary isaacar was stripped of all his upper clothing and stretched on the accursed rack then commenced the torture the agonizing torture by means of that infernal instrument a torture which dislocated the limbs appeared to tear the members asunder and produced sensations as if all the nerves of the body were suddenly being drawn out through the brain dost thou confess and wilt thou embrace the christian faith demanded the grand inquisitor from time to time i have nothing to confess 
i will not renounce the creed of my forefathers answered isaachar in a tone of bitter agony as he writhed upon the rack while every fresh shock and jerk of the infernal engine seemed as if it would tear the very life out of him but the old man remained firm in the declaration of his innocence of the dreadful crime imputed to him staunch also to his creed did he remain and having endured the full extent of that special mode of torture he was borne back to his dungeon cruelly injured with dislocated limbs blood streaming from his mouth and nostrils and these terrible words the grand inquisitor ringing in his ears obstinate and impertinent one satan claims thee as his own and therefore art thou condemned to death by fire at the approaching auto de fe half an hour afterward another human being lay stretched upon that accursed rack and agonizing oh most agonizing were the female shrieks and rending screams which emanated from the lips of the tortured victim but which reached not beyond the solid masonry of those walls and the massive iron-plated door the white and polished arms were stretched out in a position fearfully painful beyond the victim's head and the wrists were fashioned to a steel bar by means of a thin cord which cut through flesh muscle and nerve to the very bone the ankles were attached in a similar manner to a bar at the lower end of the rack and thus from the female's hands and feet thick clots of gore fell on the stone pavement but even the blood flowed not so fast from her lacerated limbs as streamed the big drops of agony from her distorted countenance that countenance is so beautiful and so well beloved by the emmanuel d'orsini for oh upon that rack lay stretched the fair and half-naked form of guilia of aristino its symmetry convulsing in matchless tortures the bosom palpitating awfully with the pangs of that earthly hell and the exquisitely moulded limbs enduring all the piteous pains of dislocation as if the fibres that held them in their sockets were drawn out to, to a tension at which they must inevitably snap in halves the two gazes on that awful spectacle whose ears drink in those agonizing screams as if they made a delicious melody which folded arms compressed lips and remorseless though ashy pale countenance the old lord of aristino stands near the rack and if his eyes can for a moment quit that feast which they devour so greedily it is but to glance with demonic triumph toward manuel d'orsini whom an atrocious refinement of cruelty suggested by the vengeful count himself has made a spectator of that appalling scene and terrible are the emotions which rend the heart of the young marquis but he is powerless he cannot stretch forth a hand to save his mistress from the hellish torments which she is enduring nor can he even whisper a syllable to inspire her with courage to support them for he is bound tightly the familiars too have him in their iron grasp and he is gagged nevertheless he can see and he can hear he can behold the rending tortures of the rack and he is compelled to listen to the piercing screams which the victim sends forth if he closes his eyes upon the horrible spectacle imagination instantly makes it more horrible even still and moreover in the true spirit of a chivalrous heart he seeks by the tenderness of his glances to impart at least a gleam of solace to the soul of her who has undergone so much and is suffering now so much more through her fatal love of him the grand inquisitor who is an intimate friend of the count of aristino ministers well and faithfully to the infernal vengeance of that old italian noble for the remorseless judge urges on the torturers to apply the powers of the rack to the fullest extent and while the creaking sound of wheels mingles with the cracking noises of dislocated limbs the count of aristino exclaimed i was once humane and benevolent guilia but thy conduct has made me a fiend a fiend shrieked the tormented woman oh yes yes thou art a fiend a very fiend i have wronged thee but this vengeance is horrible mercy mercy oh for one drop of water mercy mercy the rat gave a last shock to which its utmost power was capable a scream more dreadful more agonizing more piercing than any of its predecessors rent this time the very walls of the torture chamber and with this last outburst of mortal agony the spirit of the guilty guilia fled for ever yet was not the vengeance of the count of aristino satisfied and the grand inquisitor was prepared to gratify the hellish sentiment to the fullest extent the still warm and palpitating corpse of the countess was hastily removed from the rack and the familiar stripped nay tore off the clothing of manuel d'orsini the countenance of the young nobleman was now terribly sombre as if the darkest thoughts were occupying his inmost soul and his eyes were bent fixedly on the dreadful engine to the tortures of which it appeared to be his turn to submit the familiars in order to divest him of his garments and also to stretch him in such a way on the rack that his arms might be fastened over his head to the upper end of that instrument had removed the chains and cords which had hitherto bound him and now the fatal moment seemed to be at hand 
and the familiars already grasped him rudely to hurl him on to the rack when as if suddenly inspired by a superhuman strength the young nobleman dashed the men from him then with lightning speed he seized a massive iron bar that was to be used to move the windlass of the rack and in another instant before a saving arm could intervene the deadly instrument struck down the count of arestino at the feet of the grand inquisitor who started back with a cry of horror the next moment the marquis was again powerless and secure on the grasp of the familiars but he had accomplished his purpose he had avenged his mistress and himself and the old lord of arestino lay with shattered skull a corpse upon the cold pavement of the torture chamber back back with the murderer to his dungeon exclaimed the grand inquisitor in a tone of fearful excitement and rage we must not afford him a chance of dying upon that engine of torture no no the lingering flames of the auto de fe are reserved for the marquis of orsini and in pursuance of the sentence thus pronounced manuel was hurried away to his dark and solitary cell there to remain a prey to the, all the dreadful thoughts which the occurrences of that fatal evening were so well calculated to marshal in horrible array to his imagination end of section sixty five Section sixty six of Wagner the Werewolf by George W. M. Reynolds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter sixty one. While those awful scenes were being enacted in the subterranes of the Holy Inquisition, Demetrius was actively engaged in directing those plans and effecting those arrangements which the scheming disposition of Nisida of Riverola had suggested we should observe that in the morning he had sought and found antonio with whom he had so expertly managed that the villain had fallen completely into the snare spread to entrap him and had not only confessed that he held at his disposal the liberty of the count of riverola but had also agreed to deliver him up to the greek in a word everything in this respect took place precisely as nisida had foreseen accordingly so soon as it was dark in the evening sixty of the ottoman soldiers quitted by two and threes the mansion which the florentine government had appropriated as a dwelling for the envoy and his suit the men whom demetrius thus entrusted with the execution of his scheme and whose energy and fidelity he had previously secured by means of liberal reward and a promise of more were disguised in different ways but were all well armed to be brief so well were the various dispositions taken and so effectively were they executed that those sixty soldiers had concealed themselves in the grove indicated by their master without having excited in the minds of the florentine people the least suspicion that anything unusual was about to take place it was close upon eleven o'clock at night when demetrius after having obtained a hasty interview with nisida whom he acquainted with the progress of the plot repaired to the grove wherein his men were already distributed and took his station in the midst of the knot of olives on the right of the huge chestnut tree which overhung the chasm nearly a quarter of an hour elapsed and naught was heard save the waving of the branches and the rustling of the foliage as the breeze of night agitated the grove but at the expiration of that brief period the sound of voices was suddenly heard close by the chestnut tree not preceded by any footsteps nor other indication of the presence of men and thus appearing as if they had all at once and in an instant emerged from the earth not a moment had elapsed no not a moment ere those individuals whose voices were thus abruptly heard were captured and secured by a dozen ottoman soldiers who sprung upon them from the dense thickets around or dropped amongst them from the branches overhead and so admirably was the swoop made that five persons were seized bound and held powerless and incapable of resistance ere the echo of the cry of alarm which they raised had died away in the maze of the grove and simultaneously with the performance of this skilful manoeuvre a shrill whistle was wafted from the lips of demetrius through the wood and as if by magic a dozen torches were seen to light up and numbers of men with naked scimitars gleaming in the rays of those firebrands rushed toward the spot where the capture had been made the effect of that sudden illumination those flashing weapons and that convergence of many warriors all toward the same point was striking in the extreme and as the glare of the torches shone on the countenances of the four men in the midst of whom was francisco the whole five however being held bound and powerless by the ottoman soldiers it was evident that the entire proceeding had inspired the guilty wretches with the most painful alarm demetrius immediately knew that the handsome and noble-looking young man in the midst of the group of captives and captors must be don francisco of riverola and he also saw at a glance that one of the ruffians with him was antonio but he merely had leisure at that moment to address a word of reassurance and friendship to nisida's brother for lo 
the secret of the entrance to the robber's stronghold was revealed discovered yes there at the foot of the tree and now rendered completely visible by the glare of the torchlight was a small square aperture from which the trap-door had been raised to afford egress to the captured party secure that entrance cried demetrius hastily and hasten down those steps some dozen of you so as to guard it well then the instant this command was obeyed he turned toward francisco saying lord of riverola am i right in thus addressing you such is my name answered francisco and if you brave chief will but release me and lend me a sword i will prove to thee that i have no particular affection for these miscreants demetrius gave the necessary order and in another moment the young count of riverola was not only free but with a weapon in his hand the greek then made a rapid but significant fatally significant sign to his men and quick as thought the three robbers and their confederate antonio were strangled by the bowstrings which the ottomans whipped round their necks a few stifled cries and all was over thus perished the wretch antonio one of those treacherous malignant and avaricious italians who bring dishonour on their noble nation a man who had sought to turn the vindictive feelings of the count of aristino to his own purposes alike to fill his purse and to wreak his hateful spite on the riverola family scarcely was the tragedy enacted when demetrius ordered the four bodies to be conveyed down the steps disclosed by the trap-door for said he we will endeavour so to direct our proceedings that not a trace of them shall be left upon ground as the florentines would not be well pleased if they learnt that foreign soldiers have undertaken the duties which they themselves should perform several of the ottomans accordingly bore the dead bodies down the steps and demetrius accompanied by francisco followed at the head of the greater portion of the troops a sufficient number however remaining behind to constitute a guard at the entrance of the stronghold while they were yet descending the stone steps demetrius seized the opportunity of that temporary lull in the excitement of the night's adventures to give francisco hasty but welcome tidings of his sister and the reader may suppose that the generous-hearted young count was overjoyed to learn that nisida was not only alive but also once more an inmate of the ancestral home demetrius said nothing relative to flora and francisco not dreaming for a moment that his deliverer even knew that there was such a being in existence asked no questions on that subject his anxiety was not however any less to fly to the cottage for it must be remembered that he was arrested first on the third of july and had yet to learn all the afflictions which had fallen upon flora and her aunt afflictions of the existence whereof he had been kept in utter ignorance by the banditti during his long captivity of nearly three months in their stronghold but while we are thus somewhat digressing the invaders are penetrating further into the stronghold headed by demetrius and francisco and all carrying their drawn scimitars in their hands the corps proceeded along a vast vaulted subterrane paved with flagstones until a huge iron door stood with nails barred the way stay whispered francisco suddenly recollecting himself i think i can devise a means to induce the rogues to open this portal or i am much mistaken he accordingly seized the torch and hurried back to the foot of the stone steps in the immediate vicinity of which he searched narrowly for some object at last he discovered the object of his investigation namely a large bell hanging in a niche and from which a strong wire ran up through the ground to the surface this bell francisco set ringing and then hurried back to rejoin his deliverers scarcely was he again by the side of demetrius when he saw that his stratagem had fully succeeded for the iron door swung heavily round on its hinges and in another moment the cries of terror which the two robber sentinels raised on the inner side were hushed forever by the turkish scimitars down another flight of steps the invaders then precipitated themselves another door at the bottom having been opened in compliance with the same signal which had led to the unfolding of the first and now the alarm was given by the sentinels guarding the second post those sentinels flying madly on having beholden the immolation of their comrades but demetrius and francisco speedily overtook them just as they emerged from another long vaulted and paved cavern passage and were about to cross a plank which connected the two sides of a deep chasm in whose depths a rapid stream rushed gurgling on into the turbid waters the two fugitive sentinels were cast over the bridge poured the invaders and into another cavern corridor hollowed out of the solid rock did they enter the torch-bearers following immediately behind the greek and the young count it was evident that neither the cries of the surprised sentinels nor the tread of the invaders had alarmed the main cause of the banditti for on reaching a barrier formed by massive folding doors and knocking thereat 
the portals instantly began to move on their hinges and in rushed the ottoman soldiers headed by their two gallant christian leaders the robbers were in the midst of a deep carouse in their magnificent cavern hall when their festivity was thus rudely interrupted we are betrayed thundered lomellino the captain of the horde to arms to arms but the invaders allowed them no time to concentrate themselves in a serried phalanx and tremendous carnage ensued surprised and taken unaware as they were their banditti fought as if a spell were upon them paralyzing their energies and warning them that their last hour was come the terrible scimitars of the turks hewed them down in all directions some who sought to fly were literally cut into pieces lomellino fell beneath the sword of the gallant count of Rarola, and within twenty minutes after the invaders first set foot in the banqueting hall not a soul of the formidable horde was left alive demetrius abandoned the plunder of the den to his troops and when the portable part of the rich booty had been divided amongst them they returned to their own grove into which the entrance of the stronghold opened when the subterrane was thus cleared of the living and the dead alone remained in that place which had so long been their home and was now their tomb demetrius ordered his forces to disperse and return to their quarters in florence in the same prudent manner which had characterized their egress thence a few hours before francisco and demetrius being left alone together in the grove proceeded by torchlight to close the trap-door which they found to consist of a thick plate of iron covered with earth so prepared by glutinous substances no doubt that it was hard as rock and thus when the trap was shut down not even a close inspection would lead to a suspicion of its existence so admirably did it fit into its setting and correspond with the soil all around it required moreover but a slight exercise of their imaginative powers to enable demetrius and francisco to conjecture that every time any of the banditti had come forth from their stronghold they were accustomed to strew a little fresh earth over the entire spot and thus afford an additional precaution against the chance of detection on the part of any one who might chance to stray in that direction we may also add that the trap-door was provided with a massive bolt which fastened it inside when closed and that the handle of the bell-wire which gave a signal to open the trap was concealed in a small hollow in the old chestnut tree having thus satisfied his curiosity by means of these discoveries demetrius accompanied francisco to the city and during their walk thither he informed the young count that he was an envoy from the ottoman grand vizier to the florentine government that he had become acquainted with nisida on board the ship which delivered her from her lonely residence on an island in the mediterranean and that as she had by some means or other learnt where francisco was imprisoned he had undertaken to deliver him the young count renewed his warmest thanks to the chivalrous greek for the kind interest he had manifested in his behalf and they separated at the gate of the riverola mansion into which francisco hurried to embrace his sister while demetrius repaired to his own abode the meeting between nisida and her brother francisco was affecting in the extreme and for a brief space the softer feelings in the lady's nature triumphed over those strong turbulent and concentrated passions which usually held such indomitable sway over her for her attachment to him was profound and sincere and the immense sacrifice she made in what she conceived to be his welfare and interest had tended to strengthen this almost boundless love on his side the young count was rejoiced to behold his sister whose strange disappearance and long absence had filled his mind with the worst apprehensions yes he was rejoiced to see her once more beneath the ancestral roof and with a fond brother's pride he surveyed her splendid countenance which triumph and happiness now invested with an animation that rendered her surpassingly beautiful a few brief and rapidly given explanations were exchanged between them by means of the language of the fingers francisco satisfying nisida's anxiety in respect to the success of her project by which the total extermination of the banditti had been effected and she conveying to him as much of the outline of her adventures during the last seven months as she thought it prudent to impart they then separated it being now very late and moreover nisida still had some work in hand for that night the moment francisco was alone he exclaimed aloud oh is it possible that this dear sister who loves me so much is really the bitter enemy of flora but to-morrow to-morrow i must have a long explanation with nisida and heaven grant that she may not stand in the way of my happiness oh flora dearest flora if you knew how deeply i have suffered on your account during my captivity in that accursed cavern and what must you have thought of my disappearance my absence alas did the same vengeance which pursued me wreck its spite also on thee fair girl did the miscreant antonio 
who boastingly proclaimed himself to my face the author of my captivity and who sullenly refused to give me any tidings of those whom i cared for and of what was passing in the world without did he dare to molest thee but suspense is intolerable i cannot endure it even for a few short hours no i will speed me at once to the dwelling of my flora and thus assued her grief and put an end to my own fears at the same time having thus resolved francisco repaired to his own apartment enveloped himself in a cloak secured weapons of defence about his person and then quitted the mansion unperceived by a living soul almost at the same time but by another mode of egress namely the private staircase leading from her own apartments into the garden and which has been so often mentioned in the course of this narrative donna nisida stole likewise from the riverola palace she was habited in male attire and beneath her doublet she wore the light but strong cuirass which she usually donned ere setting out on any nocturnal enterprise and which she was now particularly cautious not to omit from the details of her toilet inasmuch as the mysterious appearance of the muffled figure which had alarmed her on the previous evening induced her to adopt every precaution against secret and unknown enemies whither was the lady nisida now hurrying through the dark streets of florence what new object had she in contemplation her way was bent toward an obscure neighbourhood in the immediate vicinity of the cathedral and in a short time she reached the house in which dame margaretha antonio's mother dwelt she knocked gently at the door which was shortly opened by the old woman who imagined it was her son that sought admittance for though in the service of the count of aristino antonio was often kept abroad late by the various machinations in which he had been engaged and it was by no means unusual for him to seek his mother's dwelling at all hours margaretha who appeared in a loose wrapper hastily thrown on held a lamp in her hand and when its rays streamed not on the countenance of her son but showed the form of a cavalier handsomely apparelled she started back and mingled astonishment and fear a second glance however enabled her to recognise the lady nisida and an exclamation of wonder escaped her lips nisida entered the house closed the door behind her and motioned dame margaretha to lead the way into the nearest apartment the old woman obeyed tremblingly for she feared that the lady's visit boded no good and this apprehension on her part was not only enhanced by her own knowledge of all antonio's treachery toward count francisco but also by the imperious manner determined looks and strange disguise of her visitress but margaretha's terror speedily gave way to indescribable astonishment when nisida suddenly addressed her in a language which not for many many years had the old woman heard flow from that delicious mouth margaretha said nisida you must prepare to accompany me forthwith be not surprised to hear me thus capable of rendering myself intelligible by means of an organ on which a seal was so long placed a marvellous cure has been accomplished in respect to me during my absence from florence but you must prepare to accompany me i say your son antonio my son ejaculated the woman now again trembling from head to foot and surveying nisida's countenance in a manner denoting the acutest suspense your son is wounded mortally wounded in a street skirmish wounded shrieked margaretha oh dear lady tell me all tell me the worst what has happened to my unfortunate son he is dead he is dead your manner convinces me that hope is past and she wrung her hands bitterly while tears streamed down her wrinkled cheeks no he is not dead margaretha exclaimed nisida but he is dying and he implored me by everything i deem sacred to hasten thither and fetch you to him that he may receive your blessing and close his eyes in peace in peace repeated the old woman bitterly then to herself she said donna nisida suspects not his perfidy knows not all his wickedness delay not urged the lady perceiving what was passing in her mind you are well aware that my brother who alas has disappeared most mysteriously dismissed antonio abruptly from his service many months ago but whatever were the cause it is forgotten at least by me so tarry not but prepare to accompany me margaretha hastened to her bedroom and reappeared in a few minutes completely dressed and ready to issue forth keep close by me said nisida as she opened the house door and breathe not a word as we pass through the streets i have reasons of my own for assuming a disguise and i wish not to be recognized margaretha was too much absorbed in the contemplation of the afflicting intelligence which she had received to observe anything at all suspicious in these injunctions and thus it was that the two females proceeded in silence through the streets leading toward the riverola mansion 
by means of a pass-key nisida opened the wicket-gate of the spacious gardens and she traversed the grounds margaretha walking by her side in a few minutes they reached a low door affording admission into the basement story of the palace and of which nisida always possessed the key go first said the lady in a scarcely audible whisper i must close the door behind us but wherefore this way demanded margaretha a sudden apprehension starting up in her mind this door leads down to the cellars the officers of justice are in search of antonio and i am concealing him for your sake was the whispered and rapid assurance given by nisida would you have him die in peace in your arms or perish on the scaffold margaretha shuddered convulsively and hurried down the dark flight of stone steps upon which the door opened terrible emotions raged in her bosom indescribable alarms grief suspicion and also a longing eagerness to put faith in the apparent friendship of nisida give me your hand said the lady and the hand that was thrust into hers was cold and trembling then nisida hurried margaretha along a narrow subterranean passage in which the blackest night reigned and though the old woman was a prey to apprehensions that increased each moment to a fearful degree she dared not utter a word either to question to implore or to remonstrate at length they stopped and nisida dropping margaretha's hand drew back heavy bolts which raised ominous echoes in the vaulted passage in another moment a door began to move stubbornly on its hinges and almost at the same time a faint light gleamed forth increasing in power as the door opened wider but still attaining no greater strength than that which a common iron lamp could afford margaretha's anxious glances were plunged into the cellar or vault to which the door opened and whence the light came but she saw no one within it however appeared as if some horrible reminiscence connected with the place came back to her startled mind for falling on her knees and clinging wildly to her companion she cried in a piercing tone o oh, lady wherefore have you brought me hither where is my son what does all this horrible mystery mean but chiefly now of all why why are we here at this hour in a few moments you shall know more exclaimed nisida and as she spoke with an almost superhuman strength she dragged or rather flung the prostrate woman into the vault rushing in herself immediately afterward and closing the door behind her holy god shrieked margaretha gazing wildly round the damp and naked walls of solid masonry and then up at the lamp suspended to the arched ceiling is this the place but no you are ignorant of all that it was not for that you brought me hither speak lady speak where is antonio what have i done to merit your displeasure o oh, mercy mercy bend not those terrible glances upon me your eyes flash fire you are not nisida you are an evil spirit o oh, mercy mercy and thus did the miserable woman rave as kneeling on the cold damp ground she extended her tightly clasped hands in an imploring manner toward nisida who drawn up to her full height was contemplating the grovelling wretch with eyes that seemed to shoot forth shafts of devouring flame terrible indeed was the appearance of nisida like to an avenging deity was she no longer woman in the glory of her charms and the elegance of her disguise but a fury a very fiend an implacable demoness armed with the blasting lightnings of infernal malignity and hellish rancour holy virgin protect me shrieked margaretha every nerve thrilling with the agony of ineffable alarm yes call upon heaven to aid you vile woman said nisida in a thick hoarse and strangely altered voice for you are beyond the reach of human aid know ye whose remains or rather the mangled portions of whose remains lie in this unconsecrated ground ah well you may start in horror and surprise for i know all all a terrific scream burst from the lips of margaretha and he drew her wild looks around as if she were going mad detestable woman exclaimed nisida fixing her burning eyes more intently still on margaretha's countenance you are now about to pay the penalty of your complicity in the most odious crimes that ever made nights terrible in florence the period of vengeance has at length arrived but i must torture ere i slay ye yes i must give thee a foretaste of that hell to which your soul is so soon to plunge down know then that antonio your son antonio is no more not three hours have elapsed since he was slain assassinated murdered if you will so call it and by my commands o oh, lady have pity on me pity upon me a bereaved mother implored the old woman in a voice of anguish so penetrating that the vile as she was it would have moved any human being save nisida do not kill me and i will end my miserable days in a convent give me time to repent all of my sins for they are numerous and great oh spare me dear lady 
have mercy upon me have mercy upon me what mercy had you on them whose mangled remains are buried in the ground beneath your feet demanded nisida in a voice almost suffocated with rage prepare for death your last moment is at hand and a bright dagger flashed in the lamplight mercy mercy exclaimed margaretha springing forward and grasping nisida's knees i know not what mercy is cried the terrible italian woman raising the long bright glittering dagger over her head holy god protect me lady dear lady have pity upon me shrieked the agonized wretch her countenance hideously distorted and appallingly ghastly as it was raised in such bitterly earnest appeal toward that of the avengeress again i say mercy mercy die fiend exclaimed nisida and the dagger descending with lightning speed sunk deep into the bosom of the prostrate victim a dreadful cry burst from the lips of the wretched woman and she fell back a corpse oh my dear my well-beloved and never to be forgotten mother said nisida falling upon her knees by the side of the body and gazing intently upward as if her eyes could pierce the entire building overhead and catch a glimpse of the spirit of the parent whom she thus apostrophized pardon me pardon me for this deed thou didst enjoin me to abstain from vengeance but when i thought of all thy wrongs the contemplation drove me mad and an irresistible power a force which i could not resist has hurried me on to achieve the punishment of this wretch who was so malignant an enemy of thine dearest mother pardon me look not down angrily on thy daughter then nisida gave way to all the softer emotion which attended the reaction that her mind was now rapidly undergoing and being so highly strung as for the last few hours it was and her tears fell in torrents for some minutes she remained in her kneeling position and weeping till she grew afraid yes afraid of being in that lonely place with the corpse stretched on the ground a place too which for other reasons awoke such terrible recollections in her mind starting to her feet and neither waiting to extinguish the lamp which she herself had lighted at an early period of the night nor to withdraw her dagger from the bosom of the murdered margaretha nisida fled from the vault and regained her own apartment in safety and unperceived when morning dawned nisida rose from a couch in which she had obtained two hours of troubled slumber and having hastily dressed herself proceeded to the chamber of her brother francisco but he was not there nor had his bed been slept in during the past night he is searching after his flora thought nisida alas poor youth how it grieves me thus to be compelled to thwart thee in thy love but my oath and thine interests francisco demand this conduct on my part and better better it is that thou shouldst hear from strangers the terrible tidings that thy flora is a prisoner in the dungeon of the inquisition where she can issue forth only to proceed to the stake yes and better too is it that she should die than this marriage shall be accomplished nisida quitted the room and repaired to the apartment where the morning repast was served up a note addressed to herself lay upon the table she instantly recognized the handwriting of dr duras tore open the billet and read the contents as follows my brother angelo came to me very late last night and informed me that a sense of imperious duty compelled him to change his mind relative to the two women francatelli he accordingly appeared on their behalf and obtained a delay of eight days but nothing can save them from condemnation at the end of this period unless indeed immense interests be made on their account with the duke my brother alone deserves your blame dear friend let not your anger fall on your affectionate and devoted servant Geronimo Duras. nisida bit her lips with vexation she now regretted she had effected the liberation of francisco before she was convinced that flora was past the reach of human mercy but in the next moment she resumed her haughty composure she said within herself my brother may essay all his influence but mine shall prevail scarcely had she established this determination in her mind when the door was burst open and francisco pale ghastly and with eyes wandering wildly staggered into the apartment nisida who felt really deeply on his account sprung forward received him in her arms and supported him to a seat oh nisida nisida he exclaimed aloud in a tone expressive of deep anguish what will become of your unfortunate brother but it is not you who have done this no for you were not in florence at the time which beheld the cruel separation of flora and myself and throwing himself on his sister's neck he burst into tears he had apostrophized her in the manner just related not because he fancied that she could hear or understand him 
but because he forgot in the maddening paroxysms of his grief that nisida was as he believed deaf and dumb she wound her arms around him she pressed him to her bosom she covered his pale forehead with kisses while her heart bled at the sight of his alarming sorrow suddenly he started up flung his arms wildly about and exclaimed in a frantic voice bring me my steel panoply and give me my burgonet my cuirass and my trusty sword and let me arouse all florence to a sense of its infamy in permitting that terrible inquisition to exist bring me my armour i say the same sword i wielded on the walls of rhodes and i will soon gather a trusty band to aid me but overcome with excitement he fell forward dashing his head violently upon the floor before nisida could save him she pealed the silver bell that was placed upon the breakfast table and assistance soon came francisco was immediately conveyed to his chamber dr duras was sent for and on his arrival he pronounced the young nobleman to be laboring under a violent fever the proper medical precautions were adopted and the physician was in a few hours able to declare that francisco was in no immediate danger but that several days would elapse ere he could possibly become convalescent nisida remained by his bedside and was most assiduous most tender most anxious in her attentions toward him and when he raved in his delirium of flora and the inquisition it went to her very heart to think that she was compelled by a stern necessity to abstain from exerting her influence to procure the release of one whose presence would prove of far greater benefit to the sufferer than all the adenines and drugs which the skill of dr duras might administer End of section 66